This is the Future of IP Protection Podcast, brought to you by Mark Vision. This show is dedicated to arming companies with the skills, know-how, and technology they will need to future-proof their IP protection strategy for the years ahead. It's Brandy Spence from Mark Vision, and I'm excited to bring you another episode of the Future of IP Protection Podcast. Today, we have a true expert on the show, Randy Houston Jr., Assistant and General Counsel at BuzzFeed. Randy has over 27 years of IP and entertainment law, working with companies of all sizes to protect their trademarks and copyrights. So he is the perfect person to help us navigate the ever-changing world of IP protection. So with that, let's just dive right in. Hi, Randy. Hi, Brandy. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for joining us. I'm looking forward to our conversation here. So let's dive right in and have you sort of start by telling us a little bit about your background and how you got into the world of intellectual property and entertainment law. So as uh, as you mentioned, I'm I'm in my 28th year practicing law, but specifically practicing in the entertainment and uh, and intellectual property space. And frankly, this is the only area of law I've ever practiced in. It's the only area of law I ever wanted to practice in. In fact, this is really why I went to law school. Uh, I came to university as an engineer, believe it or not. No kidding. Uh, But I come from a musical family and I've been a musician my entire life since I was 10 years old. So that's always been a part of what makes me me, apart from any professional pursuits. But once I realized that I was not an engineer and that wasn't how I wanted to spend my life, I was looking for something to do with music which is my passion, but something that wasn't necessarily going to have me, you know, busking on the streets and, and you know, hustling for pennies. And so I came to understand that there was an area of law that uh, was specific to entertainment, but also because of my engineering and science background, that it also sort of dovetailed with that. And that's how I discovered intellectual property. And I was probably a sophomore, at best a junior in college when I started to really explore this field. And this is, we're talking about, you know, the very late 1980s or the early 1990s before IP was a really bustling field. So by the time I got through law school and and came out and started practicing in the mid 90s, IP was one of the hottest areas. And it was something that I was, I I think, uniquely qualified to practice in. And as I said, I've been doing it for going on 28 years and and haven't looked back and haven't thought about doing anything else. And it's, it's where I'm really happy. That's incredible. So you are obviously uniquely qualified to talk about some of the unique challenges that this industry in particular has in protecting IP field. Can you give us any specific examples of how you've helped some companies navigate these challenges? Yeah, so I I would say the, the biggest challenge I'm seeing companies face today, and it's the same challenge that it was, you know, 25 plus years ago, is just keeping up with the technology. The technology does not slow down and businesses do not stop adapt. If you are the company that isn't keeping up, chances are your competitor is. And so that's the challenge, I think, for businesses is keeping up or or even in fact, in fact, keeping ahead of your competitors. And and I would say, you know, this goes all the way back in my practice because I I had the benefit of being there for the dot-com boom in the late 90s. What I mean by there is being in the intellectual property space. And I was practicing in Austin, Texas, the live music capital of the world. And and one of the cool things I got to do as a mid-level intellectual property lawyer, but as a burgeoning entertainment lawyer, was work with some startup companies that were taking sort of broadband technology into the nightclubs in Austin, Texas. And their business model was, if you can't come to Austin, Texas, we're going to bring Austin, Texas and the live music of Austin, Texas to you. And they were broadcasting nightclub shows on the internet for people everywhere in the world. And so there was the challenge. There were all of the intellectual property licensing and and those types of issues that came up, as well as just wrapping your arms around broadband, because broadband was this thing that people like to talk about as sort of the end all be all back then. It was not nearly as commonplace as it is now, but then that was a challenge that people were trying to get the biggest and the best. And so as an intellectual property lawyer, I got to bring in sort of all my black letter knowledge, but then apply it in these really, really unique spaces. A more modern example of that, I was in-house with NBC Sports about 10 years ago during the sort of advent of TV everywhere. 
And at the time, we all thought, wow, this is a really cool concept that, you know, wherever you are, you'll be able to pull out your phone. And even the service that you can get on your phone now is not what you could get 10 years ago. And so the idea that you could pull out your phone or your tablet or your laptop and watch TV literally anywhere you were, even then we didn't envision that you would be able to subscribe to, you know, one streaming carrier and get sort of a monthly package and get, you know, as many channels you could as you can get from your cable provider and carry that around around in your pocket, but that's what that became. And, and uh, you know, I'm proud to say that NBC was sort of ahead of the curve, but then all of the other networks caught up and, and were competing and they're still competing. But yeah, I, that was, a, I think, a situation of being in the right place at the right time and getting to help develop what this technology would and could become. And so, again, I think it really is about keeping up with the space that you're in, whatever industry you're in, the changes are different, but the same. And if you don't do it, your competitors are going to do it and you're going to get left in the dust. So that's the yeah. advice I would give. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Now, you did mention some of these technologies of broadband and obviously TV anywhere. Are you seeing any specific technology now, you know, that that is exciting and new, especially as it pertains to the entertainment industry or even IP protection industry that you're excited about? There are a couple of uh, spaces that in there and they're probably I, I'm sure that all a lot of your other guests are talking about them. And I think some I've even seen some of your episodes where you're talking about them. But I, I think, you know, the ones that jump out at me the most uh, and again, they sort of apply across all industries. The multiverse is huge. Yeah. Uh, and it was something that as an older person and and as an IP lawyer, I sort of poo pooed it in the beginning. And that's not going to go anywhere. And it's everywhere. And it's only going to be more everywhere. It's only going to be more ubiquitous. Uh, and so it's something that we just can't ignore. And how businesses are literally buying virtual plots of land on the multiverse and setting up shop, as it were, uh, mm -hmm. almost in a brick and mortar sense. So it's kind of right. like we've come full circle in the multiverse. That is huge. The advent of NFTs. Again, I still am not sure that most people understand what they are or what the capability there really is, but it's huge. It's a space that whether your business is one that needs to be or will ever be in that space is something I think you need to know about as a business owner and certainly as an IP lawyer. And I think probably the biggest and, and the biggest unknown right now is uh, artificial intelligence. AI is everywhere and it seems to have crept up on us really, really quickly. And so I think we have to keep, we all, lawyers and lay people alike, we have to keep our eye on that because there's just no telling where that particular technology is going to go or, or how it's going to apply when I think about the three of them, the multiverse, NFTs, and AI together. I, I Frankly, I don't even want to think about it. It's a little bit frightening, but it, it, the places that we could go with that and the possibilities for any of those individually or, or collectively, it's pretty amazing. And it's something that we do have to keep abreast of. Yeah, absolutely. So with your personal background in music and entertainment, can you speak to any specific examples that you've seen in terms of the intersection of IP and how the creative arts have shaped the industry over time? When I started practicing law in the mid 90s, the recording industry was essentially what the recording industry was in the 60s and 70s and 80s. It was this sort of run of the mill, you know, everybody trying to get into it space very, very much dominated by the record companies and the recording industry. And these, you know, monumental 70, 80, 90, 100 page uh, record deals uh, that every musician wanted one of, but none of them understood what it was about. And that was sort of how I cut my teeth as a music lawyer. But within the first five years of practicing law, there came digital music technology and MP3s and no one knew what this was. And everybody assumed, OK, it's very illegal and you can't have these on your computer. And so I became one of, I would say, the countries and maybe the leading legal experts in the world on that specific technology just to make sure that people knew what it was and what it wasn't and that it sort of wasn't inherently illegal, but that they were certainly illegal applications. Everyone knows about Napster and all the litigation that came out of that. 
But then fast forward five years or 10 years to, you know, the mid 2000s or the late 2000s, and we had iTunes. And, and we look at what the recording industry is now and how DIY the recording industry has become and how little reliance there is on record companies and, and the traditional, I think, recording industry stalwarts. It's very much an industry where you can do something in your bedroom on your computer, get it out to the right people or the right sources. And, you know, we've all heard about SoundCloud rappers and we've all heard about how Justin Bieber became a household name from YouTube. That's really happening. And it's and you now know, you have TikTok again, like everything in this space and everything with technology, it just doesn't stop. So just as soon as you think you understand one aspect of it, there's something new. You know, TikTok is a phenomenon of maybe the last five years, but that has grown exponentially. And again, it's continuing to grow. So both in the, the music and entertainment space, but in just the general media space where I work daily, TikTok is something that can't be ignored. Even if you're an older person and you want to ignore it, you can't ignore it. It's a great means of promotion, but it's also legitimate content in its own right. And so that's a perfect example of how, you know, something like the record industry is adapting to the technology rather than vice versa. Certainly. Hey, I tell you what, my kids don't let me ignore it. I'm constantly being bombarded with texts from TikTok. Yeah, it's ju it's better just not to ignore it. It <laughs> really is. With the rise of social media, right, and user generated content, such as, you know, these artists that are creating, you know, music right on TikTok and it's becoming discovered or just any other content. How do you think the IP laws will need to evolve um, in order to keep going um, with this ever changing landscape of online content creation? Th that's interesting, because when I think about particularly the Internet and, and content on the Internet, one of the things, again, that I was around for when I started practicing law, we were dealing with the, the old 1970 Copyright Act. Then in 1998, 1999, came the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and it, it contemplated a lot of situations that we couldn't have conceived of then, but that are really applicable now. And so... I don't offer that to say that the law will not need to change and that there won't be further amendments to it. But what I what I would say is that the Digital Millennium Copyright Act really did a great job of preparing us for the space that we're in now. What's interesting to me now is how different lawyers, both plaintiffs, lawyers and defense lawyers, are applying that to either protect copyrighted subject matter or to defend their clients who are accused of infringing copyrighted subject matter. It, it's, it's absolutely fascinating to me. It's something that I deal with regularly in the image space, for example. So, and, and particularly on social media, the media companies that I have worked for use social media extensively to promote themselves, to promote their content. But they often get into, you know, little snafus involving publishing someone else's content, whether it's a snippet of a song or it's an image or if it's a snippet of a video. And so taking these laws that I've been working with for, you know, 20 plus years and now applying them to social media, we were already applying them sort of broadly on the Internet and on websites, but now applying them to social media. It's fascinating, but we don't necessarily need any new laws to apply there. We just are applying the old laws in new ways. Now, I think that social media doesn't end with TikTok, so that's not going to be the last big thing. And, and something may come along in five years or five weeks from now that none of us contemplated. And we will have to, Congress will have to act to you know, respond to that. I think we're in a good place now. I don't think we should be complacent. And I think that we should be ready to either amend the DMCA or create new copyright laws that will protect how people are distributing content or how people are creating content. I mean, one of the challenges, and we talked about it a, a little bit ago, is artificial intelligence, right? There's still some very serious questions about whether the copyright law covers those things because we don't necessarily know who the creator is. And that's a that's an integral part of, of applying copyright law. We've got to know who created it. And so I'm curious, and I've, I have this conversation with my colleagues a lot, looking at how our existing laws will apply to AI or whether we're going to have to create some new, again, speaking of copyright specifically, some new copyright law to 
govern and protect content created by artificial intelligence? I don't know the answer to that. I'm curious about the answer to that, but I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, so that's interesting. You're talking about protecting the content created with AI. I, and I think, okay, some of the conversations I've been having are with people about AI using content that's already been created from others, right? And then returning sure. it as something original. And then how do you really protect against that? So obviously there are a lot of questions around that as well, which will be interesting to watch. The ownership question, I think it all sort of hinges on that ownership question, whether it's whether we're looking at protection or we're looking at using that content that's already been created. The ownership question is a big one, and I'm not sure how we answer that. I, we could go a lot of different ways. We'll, we'll see. Ultimately, we'll see which way the courts go. And I think that's pending in some courts right now. We're going to get some decisions that are going to give us some guidance. And as I've seen from my practice experience, getting a little bit of guidance is as good as getting no guidance at all, because it doesn't always answer the questions. And we're in sometimes a worse place than we were before we had it. Well, it'll be interesting to watch for sure. Finally, let's talk about what three pieces of advice would you give to IP professionals that are listening, especially those that might be interested in um, the the entertainment industry specifically? Um, what would you leave them with? I think the first piece of advice I would give is that you absolutely, and I, I think, I believe all IP lawyers are doing this anyway, but you absolutely have to stay abreast of technological advances. Being up to speed on where we were even a year ago, is just not enough. The IP space, again, I've been doing this in my, my 28th year of practice. It has changed every year, and I expect that as long as I'm doing this, it will be something new every year. And so you, you have to stay abreast of it, and even if it's an area uh, or an industry that you're not particularly fond of, you just have to stay on top of it because what happens in one industry absolutely is going to affect what happens in the industry, the other industries, and ultimately it's going to affect the industries that you do care about. So so staying on top of that, uh, of all those advances is, is my first piece. I would say, you know, from a protection standpoint, I think it's important to have, I'm speaking from an in-house perspective, but having worked yeah. in private practice and in-house, I think it's really important to have great relationships with outside counsel if you're in an in-house environment. And even if you're in private practice, I think it's great certainly keep up with your clients and what your clients are doing that may be impacted by either changes in the industries or changes in the technologies or changes in the law. But also for both in-house and private practice, it's really important to have uh, great relationships with foreign counsel because absolutely everything IP is global, absolutely everything technological is global. And then when you have the convergence of those two, you can't avoid looking at things globally. And because we're not practitioners in every country or the world or every part of the world where, you know, one particular aspect or one particular industry may be hot, it's really important, I think, to, to have those relationships. And then I guess that that would sort of cue up my, my third piece of advice, which is in everything you do, you have to have a global perspective. It's impossible to be sort of narrowly focused on your region or your country even, or certainly your industry, because it, it's all interactive. It's all very, very, very dynamic and even volatile in the sense that one little change in the music industry can then trickle down to, you know, the hospitality industry and social media or, you know, journalism and print media and those sorts of things. All is interconnected. And as I said, very, very volatile. That is part of the rush for me as an IP practitioner. But I can see how that would get boring or not boring, how that would get tiring for some people after a while, just keeping up. As soon as you, you think you've mastered one thing, we're not doing that anymore. We're over here now and, and you have to adapt. It's one way of, you know, keeping your skills up and keeping yourself sharp, but it's got to get tedious after a while. So, yeah, I think those would be my three pieces of advice. Those are three great pieces of advice. Listen, Randy, thank you so much for your time. Um, that's all the time we have for today's episode. And I want to thank you so much for your expertise and your insights today. I think we covered a lot of ground. Before we wrap up, where can our listeners go to connect with you and learn more about you and the work that you do at BuzzFeed? 
uh, the most obvious portal to to connect to BuzzFeed and 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 the uh, the BuzzFeed companies would be at BuzzFeed.com. We are a parent company of obviously BuzzFeed News and BuzzFeed Entertainment, but also the Huffington Post is a BuzzFeed company and Complex Networks and and Complex and and the various uh, sort of verticals under Complex are all part of the BuzzFeed family. So there's a lot of digital media content there for all age groups, for all interests, covering everything from food to sneakers, to popular culture, to, you know, TV, film, and music. There's a lot there. I can't keep up with it all. Fortunately, we have specialists who do. So that that's the easiest way to really keep up with what BuzzFeed and the BuzzFeed companies are doing. As for me personally, I can be found uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, Randolph B. Houston Jr. is my full professional name. I can be found on LinkedIn and you can keep up with me and what I'm doing personally and professionally there, as well as my background and the places I've worked and always glad to connect with new folks and and answer questions and and make new contacts. Awesome. Well, fantastic. Thanks again, Randy. And thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into another episode of the Future of IP Protection podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review if you enjoyed today's episode. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Future of IP Protection podcast brought to you by Mark Vision. If you enjoyed today's show, please do us a favor and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And if you'd like to learn more about how Mark Vision can help you transform your IP protection strategy, visit us at markvision.com. Thanks again, and I'll catch you on the next episode.